Irish guy, and oh boy, this is gonna be a juicy video. Today, I'm gonna tell you when was the last year that I hated every Premier League club. But relax, okay? I'm not saying that I hate them now. I'm just pinpointing a year where I really took a dislike to your team. And lads, hear me out. I've got my reasons. Right, let's go. Arsenal 2017. Lads, I have huge respect for Arsenal. They are a wonderful club with a rich history. Okay, have I got the niceties out of the way? Am I now safe from furious gunners wanting to squirt dog poison in my eye? I'm gonna say this, okay? 2017 was an uncomfortable year to peer into the Emirates Stadium. That was the year where Arsene Wenger was pilloried in post-match interviews by his own fans. There were batters in the stadium begging him to leave. His honor and character was being questioned by future jailed birds. Blokes who would soon need to sneak cigarettes into their cell by shoving them up their bum? Probably. 2017 was a poor year for the Gunners. And the likes of Mesut Ozil were coasting around the pitch with such little urgency. He was treating Premier League afternoons as if they were picnics with his dog. I mean, I have seen people butter toast with more intensity, but I don't know. I grew up when Wenger was an immortal, untouchable, invincible manager. He was told back in 2002 that he had a job for life to fast forward into the future and to see some of these meathead trolls screaming about this utter purified legend as if he was a human toad who lures children into his ice cream van. Bear in mind, 2017 was also the year where he lifted his seventh FA Cup. Oh, Wenger needs to go! There were protests, literal protests outside the Emirates Stadium. I'm sorry, had Wenger been exposed for groping grannies on the bus? Had somebody just discovered a severed head in his lunchbox? No, he was being treated like a criminal. Sorry lads, I think Arsenal is a wonderful club, yes, but 2017 is one of the most toxic 12 months I have ever seen at any club. Ask the Villa 2015. Look, I have no problem with terrible football teams if they provide comedic value. Price of Derby County in 2008 were hilarious. Getting pumped 6 in on the Premier League every month. But ask the Villa, I still remember thinking their 2015 was so insufferably boring. First of all, um, by the start of March, Paul Lambert's terrible side had managed to score two goals in their previous 10 league games. I mean, I thought letting Sadio Mane score a three-minute hat-trick against them for Southampton was annoying, as he was then flooded with what I thought was stupid overhype. I mean, when he was linked with the move to Manchester United after that, I remember thinking he was going to be a downgrade on Memphis Depay. Ah, forget about me being dropped on my head as a kid. I'm convinced my mom must have used baby Irish guy as a basketball. But as the real reason Villa broke my heart that year was because of one game, the FA Cup semi-final win over Liverpool, where a teenage Jack Grealish produced a man of the match display, running rings around Steven Gerrard, and I'm convinced it was that high-profile match on BBC which killed his Ireland career. That bloke declared for England just two weeks after his first Premier League goal, so that really did feel like I'd just seen my dog eaten by a wolf losing out on a potential £100 footballer thanks to that one breakout year. Oh, yuck. Bournemouth 2022. Look, there's never really been a year where I've hated Bournemouth, but I've had to pick one. Then maybe 2022. Lads, I want to be excited by teams who get promoted from the championship, but Bournemouth's second place finish under Scott Parker did not impress me. In the second half of that 21-22 season, they won just 11 of the final 21 league games and only carved out a win by more than two goals three times. This wasn't an exciting side at all. And seeing Parker then talk himself into an early season sack after a 9 0 defeat at Liverpool, that wasn't giving me any hope that this cherry side were going to be a patch on what Eddie Howard built. But what really grilled my liver that year was seeing all this stupid hype being given to Gary O'Neill when this 39 year old mouse of a man took the interim job. Lads, the cherries literally had Marcelo Bielsa in the building. An absolute football legend with genius ideas. I was so excited to see what he could do with this cherry squad. But now, the job instead goes to an unproven, under qualified German. Somebody who's probably constantly got a pocket filled with cheese. Just, yeah. He went on a run of eight defeats from nine games before and after the World Cup, and people were confused why he was eventually sacked? Am I missing something? Brentford 2020. Oh, this is very simple. No team has ever scared me as much as Brentford. Ever. Well, maybe Leeds. Because no, back at the start of the 1920 season, I proudly said on a previous channel which must not be named, that if the perennial championship bridesmaid Brentford actually came up that season, then I would get their gargoyle center half Pontus Janssen tattooed on my skin, then lockdown hit. And in creepy empty stadiums where you could constantly hear the left back sneeze, oh, the bees just happened to go on a ridiculous eight game winning run. Lads, I remember the final day of the championship season, all the bees had to do was beat relegation threatened Barnsley at home. And I would be having to explain to my mum just why I had a stamp tramp of a grumpy Swedish orc, but they lost bottling it in the final minute, and then they choked in the championship playoff final, with Joe Bryan scoring two goals for Fulham in extra time to rescue my body. I mean, lads, if you don't believe me, look at the top comment on Sky Sports highlight package of that match. The Irish guy is proper happy. The Irish guy is warm in his scarf tonight. Yes. Yes, I was. <laughs> 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 Yes! Oh, that was weird.
Oh boy, Brentford did terrify me in 2020. Christ, but I was having nightmares about poisonous bees. Whenever I bought a cereal multi-pack, I'd have to stab the Honey Loops box with a fork right in 2020. Yes, 2020 was the year where I developed my utter sickness for Graham Potter. If you want to pinpoint the exact year where I decided that this inevitably future England manager was some boring milk muffin overhyped to a stupid degree, then yes, it was 2020. Was I the only one who could see how insufferably dull this possession-obsessed bride inside were? Lads, here are the facts. In 2020, Potter's Brighton won five Premier League games out of 34 attempts. But what annoyed me the most were the draws. There was no winner in 16 of the league games in 2020. It was a side completely obsessed with the 1-1 draw. Yeah, I know there were squeamish nerds obsessed with their XG stats. But lads, Potter spent Christmas sitting 17th in the league. Just one point clear of the relegation zone. And yet this boring egg clumpet, someone with all the glamour and charisma of a smurf, Someone who was a total Hufflepuff. Within two years, he's been given a stupidly expensive five-year contract at Chelsea. Or he's still been paid £200,000 a week to do nothing but lick tea bags on the couch. I was the only one who knew that Potter was some smelly hipster weakling. But in 2020, we had to listen to pundits raving about him each and every week. Yuck! Chelsea 2007. Look, Josie Mourinho was sacked by Chelsea twice, yes. But the reason I'm not chucking 2015 in here is because, uh, let's be real, I understand why he was binned up. They were in a relegation scrap at Christmas. He had clearly lost the dressing room, but it was September 2007, which to this day, it's one of the biggest shows of ingratitude I've ever seen. Mourinho had already won two Premier League titles, two League Cups, and an FA Cup for Chelsea. But forget about that. Just look at their form in 2007 alone. Between January and April, Chelsea won nine league games in a row, keeping eight clean sheets in a row. And even then, the only person to find that out against them, the only person to spoil an immaculate 10 clean sheets in a row, was a budding young world star like Carlos Tevez. Uh, no shame in conceding to him. They didn't lose a single match after January. They won the FA Cup, where a Champions League penalty shootout semi-final away from reaching the Athens final against a very beatable AC Milan. Lads, in May 2007, Chelsea were still mathematically on for a quadruple. Yeah, Mourinho was sacked 10 games later. It was revolting. Disgusting. And I remember being really angry with Chelsea in the winter of 2007, and I wasn't the only one. Lampard, Drogba, Terry, the three leaders of your side. Is it any coincidence that in the next two years after Mourinho, they were all massively flirting with transfers to Inter Milan, AC Milan, and Manchester City. Crystal Palace 2013. Okay, look, this one isn't that deep. I promise you, but I just think that Crystal Palace sort of spoiled a fairy tale story in 2013. Remember back in the Championship Playoff semi final when Leicester City missed a last minute penalty against Watford, only for the Hornets to go right down the pitch and score? Dini! Yeah, that iconic moment was then sort of spoiled because it became irrelevant when Watford lost the final 1 0 to Palace. I mean, lads, Palace were the team who spluttered their way into the playoffs with relegation four, winning just one of their final 10 league matches. Come on, they were losing 4 0 at home to Birmingham. Ain't nobody was excited to see them come up. Look, they've lasted 12 years in the Premier League since then, so fair play. But again, it was written the stars for Watford, not Crystal Palace. Everton 2023. Yeah, you all know what this is about. At the start of last season, I proudly proclaimed that Sean Dyche should have Everton nowhere near the relegation zone, and that for every week they spend in it, I would have to shove a milk bucket all over my face. Lads, third team will eventually stayed up by 14 points. Then can someone please explain to me why I had about 10 showers in milk? I meant so much calcium on my skin. I actually feel like a lump of weed of Bix. Fulham 2021. Ah, oh, I am kind of reaching here. I don't think I've ever been really angry about Fulham in my life, but maybe, maybe 2021. Come on, lads, when teams bounce back from a Premier League relegation, we hope that these clubs have since learned their lessons, and now they're going to do something different and not simply waste everyone's time again. Jordy Fulham now back under Scott Parker after a gruesomely pointless relegation in 2019 where they only stuck an embarrassing 26 points on the board. Surely they were going to now have a huge improvement on that drastic humiliation. They did improve on it by two points and still went down without a whimper. What annoys me the most is that Fulham gave themselves a real chance. In March 2021, they won at Anfield. That was now just one defeat in seven matches. Parker was being talked up as some smooth future England boss. They then took two points from the final 10 games and were relegated with three games to spare. Pointless waste of time. Ipswich Town 2010. Look, I didn't hate Ipswich Town in 2010, but I didn't like what I was watching because lads, Roy Keane is an Ireland hero and he did quality work on Sunderland boss. And so I 
thought he would be the man to take Ipswich back into the Premier League, but seeing their form in 2010 made me sad, and in particular the first half of the 10-11 season, because they had a brilliant start. They were second in the league after seven games. Don't forget, Keane looked like he was getting another promotion under his belt, he established himself as one of the most effective young managers in the game, and then they implode. Twice both November and December were so uncomfortable to watch, and not just because Wagner was on the X Factor, six defeat in a row, and he was soon sacked in January, but you know what's annoying? He was sacked just two days before an epic up trip to Chelsea. Lads, we were robbed of seeing a managerial battle between Roy Keane and Carlo Ancelotti. But no, they couldn't even give us that. <laughs> and they lost 7 0 to Stanford Bridge anyway. Leicester City 2017. Yeah, I think 2017 is everyone's pick for Leicester City, right? I loved them in 2016, obviously. But when Claudio Ranieri was sacked after losing the dressing room and not even be given a full season after completing the most incredible feat in football, that didn't sit well with me or anyone else. And yes, at the time, I thought that the Leicester City dressing room were snakes. Marco Bright has come out on a podcast this week and admitted that yes, some of the players and the staff really did turn against Ranieri. Come on, he had little Leicester in the actual Champions League and this lovable little granddad wasn't even given the last 16 second leg against Sevilla at home or the quarterfinals against Atletico Madrid, you know, his former club. I'll be honest, seeing Leicester's turnaround was revolting. From losing five league games in a row without even scoring a single goal under Ranieri to then winning five in a row, it really did look like those players were trying to get the Dilly Ding, Dilly Dong King sacked. That's what the evidence looks like. So yeah, in 2017... I wasn't happy with Leicester at all. Liverpool 2012. Liverpool are an amazing club and they should always be competing at the top of the league. But the Reds in 2012 were a complete waste of time. Of their 39 league matches in 2012, they won just 11 and lost 17 under Kenny Dalglish for the first half and Brendan Rodgers for the second. They were complete garbage. Conceding three goals in defeats at grounds like Bolton, QPR, West Brom and Stoke. Losing at home to Wigan, West Brom and Fulham. The fact they needed an 88th minute goal from Luis Suarez in the second leg to scrape past Hearts by just one goal in the Europa League playoff. Hugely embarrassing. 2012 was the year where I did not recognise Liverpool as Liverpool. Lads, they had two of the greatest players in world football in Steven Gerrard and Luis Suarez. And yet they were a disaster needing penalties to beat Cardiff in a League Cup final. I didn't hate Liverpool, but I did not like that Liverpool team. I genuinely thought they were a disgrace to the badge and a complete waste of everyone's time. Man City 2014. Man City were spoiled sports in 2014. I've had no problem with Man City winning league titles in general, but in 2014, I did. I wanted Gerrard to have his romantic Premier League title win. With the Reds having come back from a disgraceful 2012, they had done amazingly to get themselves back into a Premier League title race. I just thought if Gerrard had bounced out with a Premier League title crown. It would have finally justified him rejecting Chelsea nine years earlier. A title win at 34 would have made Gerrard. Would have made Gerrard's career satisfyingly perfect. I wanted it for him. Like Francesco Totti winning Serie A with Roma. But now Man City had to ruin the fun by winning the league instead. And I remember thinking that their dressing room was actually full of arrogant munchkins because that summer Yaya Torre was threatening to leave because nobody bought him a birthday cake. Honestly, I loved City title win in 2012 but in 2014 I already thought it spoiled one of the greatest football endings of all time. Man United 2019. 2019, 2019, 2019. No other Manchester United year has quite irked me like this one. Sacking Mourinho in Christmas 2018, just months after he helped you finish second in the league, to see the job then go to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, and don't forget, Steve Bruce was linked with the job. First of all, seeing the dramatic upturn in form, 10 wins and no defeats in 12 league games, knocking PSG out of the Champions League, that wasn't Ole genius. That was a rod and dressing room only choosing to put in effort for the badge only after Josie had gone. What got me even more is that Solskjaer wasn't sacked himself before the Christmas of 2019. Something which forced me to have a milk bath, by the way. Lads, they started that season horribly. He was allowed to spend nearly £200 million in the summer, and yet they then lost to Crystal Palace, West Ham, Newcastle, Bournemouth, Watford, and some pub team from Kazakhstan before Christmas. They were 8th in the league on Christmas Day, and he still kept his job. Mourinho was binned off months after finishing 2nd, and yet Solskjaer, Zero sack despite rod and form. Pochettino was out of work. <laughs> I don't get it. 2019 seems so unfair. And I can still taste the milk. Newcastle 2020. Remember what I said about Liverpool being a pointless disgrace in 2012? Yeah. Of all the horrible relegations and pointless years under Mike Ashley, I don't think any years felt quite as hopeless as 2020. Because seeing the wonderful St. James's Park stripped of fans due to lockdown, then it really did finally expose the club for having nothing going for it. I'm going to say this. Throughout Ashley's 15-year reign of terror at St. James's Park, I don't think the club's existence has felt more pointless than in February 2020, when Newcastle welcomed bottom-of-the-table Norwich City to St. James's Park and played out a boring 0-0 draw 
with the Canaries dominating possession. The next home match was a nil-nil draw against Burnley. And this just being a few weeks after a nil-nil home draw with Oxford United in the FA Cup. This is Newcastle United. And yet under Steve Bruce, they were more boring than watching a gorilla scratch its nutsack at the zoo. I hated that Newcastle team. A club who were trying to unveil a fat Danny Rose and pretend that he was an ambitious coup. A club who led Newcastle fans into believing they were actually going to challenge for silverware now, only to then muster just 23% possession in the FA Cup quarterfinal against Man City. Registering just one shot all match? Pathetic! I mean, the 2020-21 season wasn't much better, but cries well, by December, the Magpies were travelling to Leeds United in what was geographically their biggest local derby of the season. And to see them then concede five? Hideous. 2020 was the most depressing year to be a Newcastle fan. Probably felt like realising you're, yeah, you're married to a hippopotamus. And there's no way out! This is now your life! Nottingham Forest 2011. Lads, I've been wanting to see Nottingham Forest get promoted for years. Come on, the two-time European champions? Of course I wanted to see them in the Prem. But then they battled two playoff campaigns back-to-back -back in 2010 and 2011. And yeah, when they failed to get over the line the second time, meekly losing the playoff semi-final against Swansea, I just thought, come on. Southampton 2024. Look, I don't hate Southampton, but I am frustrated by Southampton. As Russell Martin has not bothered to learn from Birdie's mistakes, and is just embarking on a naive, possession-based, play out for the back style that is not going to work. I want to see an active relegation battle, but the Saints, they're already counting themselves out. Tottenham 2021. Oh, no competition for this one. I don't care this only happened in the fourth month of 2021. Sacking Joyce Mourinho just days before a cup final against Pep Guardiola and instead replacing him with a small child. It was monumentally stupid. Even Mourinho hasn't forgiven Spurs for that. And so, yeah, for the rest of 2021, Tottenham were definitely my personal nemesis. Look, it was three years ago and I've since forgiven Tottenham. But honestly, that decision makes me mad. How on earth you sack someone who four months earlier had you top of the league in December? People like to pretend that Mourinho had to go because it was a torrid season. Nah, sorry, here are the facts. They'd recently gone 10 league games unbeaten. They'd scored 11 goals and two successive away trips. Away to Southampton at Manchester United. They'd beaten both Man City and Arsenal without conceding a goal. They'd kept a clean sheet away to Chelsea. They were in a cup final a month after sacking one of the greatest managers to ever live. This club were in talks with Roberto Martinez. Disgrace? West Ham 2012. Sorry, West Ham. I know this is a petty reason. But I wasn't a fan of you in 2012. Because, lads, my favourite neutral Premier League side of all time is Blackpool 2010. That refreshing, attack-minded, brave Ian Holloway side who deserved better than relegation. Come on, 39 points. I even told Holloway that when I met him last year. And I so desperately wanted the Tangerines to bounce back in 2012. Ian deserved another crack with this side, but no. Boring old Sam Allardyce ruined the party by beating them in the playoff final. Yeah, four years later and Blackpool were in League 2, losing to Accrington Stanley in Notts County. Heartbreaking. Wolves 2024. Three words. Gary O'Neill. Come on, Wolves. Get him gone. Anyway, that's even what... Think, what do you think? Let me know in the comments. When did you hate every Premier League club? Let me know in the comments section below. If you just don't forget to give a like, share, and subscribe. And as always, I'll talk to you in a while.